Welcome back. You are listening to The UX Coach. This is a show which explores design and research careers in the digital industry. In this episode, I'm in conversation with Tom Kerwin, product design lead at Qubit, a personalization platform where Tom has recently begun developing a UX research team. We talk about how his background in psychology and computer engineering led him to user experience design and the new skills required to become a design leader. Let's get on with the show. Tom, thank you very much for joining me on the UX Coach podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Why don't we start off by getting to know a little bit about you. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I, was, uh, I went via a typically windy route, uh, being a UX person. That's how we seem to get into this world. Uh, so I started programming when I was about seven years old, proper BBC Basic on old Acorn computers, and thought I wanted to be a computer scientist, but went to university and studied engineering and at that time, the internet was starting to explode, and I started building websites for people. And then in 1999, I found Jacob Nielsen's book, Designing Web Usability. And I read that, and I was hooked, and I did my first usability tests, uh, twisted my degree around to be usability engineering, and then went on another little detour, ended up being a designer, sort of full full stack designer, really, doing websites to logos, to posters, to everything, and got more and more frustrated with how subjective it all was and how people would come and say, well, you see, the thing is, my wife doesn't like the colour, so we want to change it. And I think, well, is your wife actually the customer? (laughs) Uh, Does it really matter? So I always wanted it to be more objective. And I had this real tension between wanting to do cool design that other designers would think was amazing and wanting to do really workable design that users could use and was valuable to the company. And uh, so struggled with that for a while. When then the world of, of A-B testing and CRO came around, I saw that as a way to make things more objective. And so dive, dove deep into that and then have sort of dipped in and out of that plus UX and product design for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and have ended right. up now at a company who make an A-B testing tool but are moving beyond it because of the limitations of this whole world of optimization. You had quite a few job roles within companies where you were more what would we would call analytics today, is that right? Um, interesting question. I suppose some analytics, but I, and I've always relied on analytics when it was available, but I'm not deep in analytics. I don't sort of live there like people who are real analysts. So tell us a little bit about, um, about Qubit and at the what it's currently doing and and maybe if you can where where it's going to so it's it's a b testing at the moment as one part of it right yeah that's right so qubit's history is really that that pedigree and they had an interesting journey through the world of optimization uh thing that seems to be happening at the moment is a real a, a sort of a sea change a shift in the market and in certain industries there is a much greater expectation of personalization becoming important. And uh, one of the things that we see as a big difference here is that while optimization has largely been driven by the brand and is about the the marketers or the people in the company wanting to push things and push their messages and change the website to their own sort of standards, um, which I think is one of the things that causes a bit of a clash with UX in general is that it, it can lean that way. With personalization, it's much more about starting with the user themselves and saying, well, what is the, given what we know about this this particular user, what's the ideal thing for them? How could we make the experience fit around what they, what they prefer, how they prefer to think, rather than how we want them to be? So it's a really interesting shift. Uh, remain to be seen whether big companies who are really ingrained in thinking about, well, we want people to buy more of this thing can turn it around and think, well, what is it the user wants? What do they want to buy or not buy? What's the what's the relevant thing right now? Mm. Uh, so it's a very interesting sort of change. And I think we're kind of at the beginning of this world of personalization. And there's not a really clear definition of what it is. But certain companies are showing some of the potential 
um, things like Netflix and Spotify. Spotify's Discover Weekly is a good example of something where it's personalised to you. No one else has the same Discover Weekly as you. And you can have a, a discussion over whether it's good or bad for you personally, but there's no doubt that they're doing something which is purely targeted at you and, in many cases, delivers something that, that really is quite unique and, and interesting. Mm. I think the, the Spotify example is one which does still blow my mind to an extent of the Discover Weekly and the Daily Mixes are very clever, but the element that I, f- I feel is missing is that it's, to me, it f- it, they come across as being a safe bet. And my my mm-hmm. love for music and the discovery of music uh, is a very big part of, of my life. But the services way, way back, Epitonic was the first one. And I, I found so many bands that I'd never heard of through that. And then Last FM, when it, when it first sort of, you know, yeah. Uh, appeared was just incredible because I always found that it was giving me artists that I'd never heard of before. Whereas I find that Spotify is actually giving me artists that it's pretty confident that it knows that I know or that I have listened to in the past. And there's, so there's an element there of, I guess, being really sensible with personalization, but then the other side of it with like Netflix, I think the, as an incredible case in point this year has been uh, sex education. So a show that has been designed where it has specifically been written to be able to appeal to the tastes of a whole wide variety of people. So it's taking that personalization to quite a real like extreme lens view of, you know, it's, it's a, it's a team based drama, but if you were to watch it, you can't work out whether it's set in England or America. The technology that you see in it is a mix of New World and the 80s. It, you know, it's trying to capture this very much the, the, the literal 18 to 35 demographic in a way that no one's ever tried before and has been incredibly successful as a result. So oh, I guess it's it's showing it's showing that there is there is some movement in there, but ultimately I guess it comes down to what kind of data you're collecting about people to start with. I think that's a huge part of it. And there's a, there's a big question about that as well. I think with the Spotify example you touched on, there is a, there's a real trade off between safety and finding stuff that you're confident that somebody likes and serendipity, the opening up to new experiences and for different people, I think, Think it seems that they have different different expectations and tolerances for those things. Uh, with Netflix, that's really interesting. That's taken that idea of personalization all the way to well, what are we what are we even going to make in the first place? How do we def- design a product that's going to satisfy this particular mm. yeah audience we're looking at? I think it's it's the logical step forward, isn't it? Particularly with like machine learning. So we know a little bit about about Qubit and how how you've ended up there. Your job role there is product design lead what does that actually entail so so what that entails it's been an interesting journey trying to work that out actually uh, over the last few months i've been there three months now um and coming in one of the things that they they knew they wanted was more of the research background so having done set up user research functions and done um done that whole thing at several companies they knew they needed some more of that because they they felt uh, they felt they weren't directly in contact with their customers enough. They weren't getting the right information from the customers they were talking to. Uh, it was it was harder than it should be. So that was a big part of it. They also have there are some designers here already, some uh, product designers who are really talented, but they're more junior. And so there was a degree of uh, mentorship and helping them to to fit into a actually a new way of working. So Qubit's done what a lot of companies have done, I think, and, and have shifted the way they're trying to build product, have moved to much more cross-functional teams, have changed from a situation that I'm sure everyone's familiar with where business and or product leads define a set of features or a set of things that we want to build and then hand it to design who make screens who then hand it to engineering, who build the code that makes the screens happen, and then we sort of push it live. What's happened, which is why I'm particularly excited to have joined at this time, is, is just as I was joining, they were really shifting 
the teams to be cross-functional, everybody to be involved with getting exposed to customers, everyone to understand the business problems and to, to join together in, in working on that. It's really exciting and everyone's very up for it, but it means that there are new ways of thinking about working as a team that people aren't perhaps familiar with yet. Um, so part of it is sort of guiding in that sense. And you, your experiences, past experiences in sort of the last five or six jobs that you've been in have been quite senior level positions, haven't they? Whether they're like explicitly labelled as being senior or I think you've, you've been head of a team at one point in time as well. Uh, um, and you were co-founder of a company too at one point in time. Yes, yeah. So I was co-founder along with quite a few other people. Um, so yeah, joint, joint co-founding uh, on two separate sort of startups, uh, but then otherwise, I've for many many of those uh, roles for the first part of my career, I was actually kind of the UX team of one. That sort of idea, um, I was the designer, and and having therefore to really work with other other roles a lot more closely than perhaps if I'd come through an agency that was a pure design agency you get used to the language of designers and the way that designers think. Mm. And it, that's really good. It has a lot of benefits that I definitely felt early in my career I was missing out on. Uh, I think that's that's a hugely valuable thing. Uh, but I do feel it's helpful that I understand how to talk with engineers and how to talk with business people and have that that level of, of uh, yeah cross-functional language to speak. Yeah. There's definitely something in the necessary makeup of someone who ends up in a a leadership position or a senior position that is around more soft skills than practitioner skills and perhaps having some background in some of those fields as well yes i think that i'm I'm sure that does help i obviously haven't tried the uh, the alternative but uh, yes (laughs) i'm sure it helps the the fact that i do understand how to make a web page on a code level this gets it that's dangerously close to the should design is code debate which we don't need to touch on uh, but i think we do need to understand other people um one of the things that i was thinking about before before having this conversation was uh, an interesting idea which someone was talking about on another podcast mentioning there's a book from ages ago called the icarus paradox mm. which i think is really fascinating have you heard about this one i have yes yeah carry on yeah, so uh, the, the thing that I think is really interesting there is, is a pattern that I think a lot of us can fall into, and I certainly have fallen into this trap, and I've seen others falling into this trap. The idea is the thing that is your greatest strength at some point becomes your greatest weakness and stops you from progressing any further. So a great example that designers might um, resonate with is we care deeply about the craft of design and the the, the skills behind making something aesthetic and perfectly formed and we know great design because that's why we got into design we love it we love great design and that can get you quite a long way because people really want that but there's a certain point in your career where your obsession with that craft and that focus on just it has to be great design becomes a blocker becomes a limiter because other things also matter and if you're not able to step back step away from the thing that has made you so successful so far and let go of it a little bit, it can be the thing that kills you. Do you mean because you haven't looked at it from the other angle, from from where someone else is coming from, or because you've you've become you're you're not willing to kill your darlings, you've become too militant in this is good design and therefore that's the end of it? I think I think a bit of both. Yeah, the, 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 I think you've got there the two sides, haven't you? There's sort of the tunnel vision of what you care about, um, and that leads to both of those, both of those effects. Yeah, difficult to talk with others and talk the same language with others who have other things that they're worrying about, and it's difficult to, as you say, kill your darlings to let go of the the things that you're there fighting for. Yeah, which which are important. But the, the problem is that a lot of things are important and maybe the things that you're, you think are important aren't the most important right now. See, I think that this is why I feel the emergence of roles like product owner uh, and to an extent product manager as well 
are creating other new avenues in career paths for designers that that weren't there even like five years ago that are a little bit less about the practitioner end and a little bit more about acknowledging that you started to think about things in a in a much more rounded way so not just Mm. about this is what's on my desk and thinking about it uh, that bigger picture which to me feels very much like the mentality of what makes a good user experience designer because I've always felt that it's really a production job it's like the this the equivalent of being a producer on a film is like the director's got a vision for how this picture is going to look and how it's going to come out and they might be involved with the funding and all the rest of it but you're the person that you know knows how to shoot that particular scene and you know how a camera works and you can go and talk to that person about that and you know you work with the writers and everything and so the the idea of a product owner seems to sort of fit into that how how different do you see the other roles that are starting to emerge within the design field and, and whether they are starting to form these natural progressions into into other areas? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there's, there, there are so many different roles and the different, the different things get called the same thing and the same thing gets called different things depending on where you are. It's all quite confusing which I think is just a, a natural evolution of, of the state that the, the whole industry is in right now. Mm. Um, one thing I've noticed, I suppose, if it, you can see it as, you could see it as, as like a huge pyramid and you start at the bottom taking a, a tiny piece of the, the big puzzle because there's so many pieces towards, if you think about the, the overall goal as you're trying to make a great product, there are so many elements that go into making a great product. You can't start out and be great at all of them. So mm. you'll start with a few of them, and those are your focus. And then you'll arbitrarily have a name that are linked to that. But as you progress in your career, you're sort of going up that pyramid and including more and more of the whole puzzle until the end result might possibly be that you're right at the top and you've got an overview over everything that goes into, into constructing that product. You could have started from writing, you could have started from coding, you could have started from design, you could have started from something completely different, analytics. But you're you're travelling all towards greater mastery of this overall context of product. Yeah. So with that, it still very much feels to me like the the driver there is is practitioner-based probably the best way I can describe it because it's about the delivery of that product what I am interested to hear of sort of your experiences on is the additional responsibilities that tend to get handed to you as you're working your way up that you know hypothetical pyramid that you're talking about and for me the big one is about uh, development and development of yourself but development of others and becoming responsible for people and how much of that have you had you've got a team at the moment obviously previous experiences is probably a better one to lean on at this point in time because this is still relatively fresh (laughs) um yeah but what's you know what are the biggest learnings that you've had from from managing teams or being responsible for other people and their development yeah so that's a a really interesting question you're right as as you go further you get more of that aspect so i haven't yet been directly managing a team in the sense of line managing I've managed to kind of sidestep that. Had the opportunity a few times, but thought that's not really what I want to do. But what I have done and has been really rewarding is much more along the lines of mentoring others and uh, coaching. I suppose it's a bit like it's more like coaching. I've, I've, that resonates more with me: the idea of coaching rather than managing. Mm-hmm. The idea of uh, and one of the big things that's hard with that I've found, if there's one thing I've learned, is that sometimes you just have to step back and let people do what they're going to do and learn what they need to learn. And you can't give them all the answers and you can't do it for them. Uh, But what you can try to do is to set up an environment where it's safe for them to try something and get rapid feedback on what is is and isn't working. Um, And and acknowledge that it also is still painful. A a really good example of this, I think, is the last company I was at, I mentored a, a bunch of people in doing usability testing and some of them, which I think is that's just a foundational skill 
for designers in general. Mm. Uh, and so I try to encourage everyone to do it. Uh, it's th- There's nothing quite like it where you make something and then you watch people actually interacting with the thing that you've made, how they respond to it, what they understood, what they didn't understand, how different their reaction is from the intent that you had. And it's an unbelievable learning experience. It can also be incredibly painful because suddenly you're you're really confronted with the fact that maybe you don't know what you're doing in all cases. Uh, and I've seen certainly people who, who love that and people who really hate that uh, and people who hate it but also appreciate that it's got a lot of value and have come to love it over time. Um, but it's it's just, yeah, that, that's been the most interesting thing for me. So I'm curious there of that what you describe of the the balance between mentoring and coaching is what I see as being like the pastoral care element uh, of, of being a manager or of, of being more experienced within a group of people. And the one element which I think is the most important thing for any manager, but is not always present. Why is it that you try to avoid taking on those types of roles in the past? What was it that was uh, putting you off of those potential management positions? What's it about that word that made you feel icky? (laughs) Um, I think I think I had a sense of, uh, I suppose, the categorical imperative of, I don't really like being told what to do. And I had... I got the sense that management was about telling people what to do. Right. And so I thought, well, I didn't want to do that. And I, I suppose I get to the point now where I actually it's not that. That's fine. I, I don't, you don't need to tell people what to do if that's not your style. And it might not be a great style for anyone, actually. Um, so that put me off. The other thing that put me off, if I'm perfectly honest, was it looks like a lot of administration. It looks like lots of form filling in and lots of calendar management mm. and lots of yeah uh, oh god like annual assessments and just just terrible things like that so that that has definitely put me off whereas when you're in more the pastoral care mode as you say then you get all the good bits you get the one-to-ones you get to uh hear how people are learning and what they're struggling with and help them to get past things that are blocking them or to think about things in a new light Uh, and you also learn an awful lot from them as well the way they think about the world opens up ideas for yourself. It's just so rewarding in comparison with filling in forms. Right, yeah. So you're part of the research ops community as well, aren't you? I am. I'm not desperately active there, yeah. but I really like the idea. Of yeah, it. so you're, you're a big fan of the concept as, as I am. And uh, I, this is one of the big areas that I think is emerging from it. And not having worked in massive enterprise in a design capacity or in a formal design capacity, I've not yet seen the concept of design ops being rolled out either. But these these sort of ops departments, to me, feel like the modern version of management in some extent, of being able to separate the mm-hmm. difference of having split disciplines within groups that help with the operation of, of a team. And so you can have people who are the more pastoral types that are there to sort of guide and nurture and and build people up and then the other side of it being that administrative stuff which was a big deal with the research ops workshops last year was all of these people that wanted to really just have someone to do the booking of user testing participants for example because they just yes. don't want to deal with that. I can totally, I can totally relate to that. Yes. <laughs> so may, maybe that's uh, something that's going to be coming forward that that will make the concept of a manager redundant. Who knows? Okay. So on the basis of these these many different roles, what is in a name? What do you think the differences are between, or the expectations? Let's say between uh, a someone who's a junior someone who is considered to be a midweight designer versus a lead or a manager or a head of team? Oh, that's a very, very good and difficult question. Um, that's something that's actually come up here is realising from uh, the designers, but also other teams as well, is how um, 
how at sea you can feel when there's not a clear progression ahead and there's not a clear picture for what what is expected from me to go up another level. What what does it look like when you go from junior to senior or to middleweight or where, wherever it would be? And the and then this is sort of exacerbated by you get a lot of places where people are given a title kind of as a reward, mm. whether or not they have actually got the skill set to step into that in another company is a totally different question but they're given that either as a reward or because it's a the company want to be able to say oh we've sent a senior designer we've sent the lead designer to your to to, to meet with you uh because that's how important you are sort of thing. Mm. um so i think that those are things which confound the whole issue uh, i found some really good examples of progressions at progression.fyi. Uh, it's got a collection of all sorts of different companies and the way they think about it. Uh, I've shared some with the, the team here, and it was actually one of them that shared the idea with me in the first place, so I should give them give them credit. Kate told me all about it. Um, and interesting getting their reactions on it, because some of the things really resonate, and they're really excited about the idea of as a junior, you should probably be strong in one or two areas, and have an understanding of a few other areas. And this then opens up the question of, well, what areas are relevant? And actually, something I've done with the team on that front is, uh, do you know Jason Messert's series on shaping design? He did a a series on Medium in December, which was all different ways of of shaping design and mapping designers' skills. Uh, And the one I've done with the team here is called Blob Mapping, which sounds very sexy. Uh, but it's it's a really helpful way of looking at here are the broad areas of design and here's how I roughly think my strengths and weaknesses are arranged around those areas. Um, so looking at those, you can see in certain areas, a junior has some affinities and things that they do quite well and other areas where they're not so hot. Um, as you move up the skill lev- ladder, you'd expect to become stronger or master level in certain skills, certain areas and perhaps gain more strength in others. But there's never an expectation, I suppose, on this, that you would be a master in every single possible area of design, from information architecture and user research through to visual graphics and uh, and motion graphics and copywriting and the whole lot. It's un- unreasonable that someone would be a master at all of those. What you seem to gain as you move up these progressions is, uh, I'm going to pick out the word that some of the the juniors here balked at actually they, they thought this is a, a really weird way to frame it but swagger being right. able to walk into a room and hold your own in a meeting in in a confident way uh, and i think it's yeah that's a difficult concept but that i think there's something in mm. that the ability to to have confidence in your own abilities the ability to navigate a cross-functional meeting with stakeholders there and be able to contribute something meaningful yeah, someone previously has mentioned the same thing of that they felt that the the point at, at when they had made it, so to speak, was when they were able to walk into a meeting and walk back out of it going, oh, I feel like I didn't get torn to shreds and that I had an answer. <laughs> I, I, I definitely can resonate with that. I'm interested with the the various different elements of a designer. If we think of these like progressions and and the inevitable, which is that, you know, if you're in a lead position, it's certain levels of responsibility that are beyond just be able what you put on paper and, and what you produce within the product, whatever that might be, is how many of those things would relate to uh, what you need to be a leader. And I'm thinking to uh, talk last year from, I think it was Stanley Wood, who's at Volvo and he uh, was talking about sort of like career paths and, and what is design leadership and, you know, what does it entail and whether all of the things, the different skills that you're picking up within your blobs are uh, practices for craft, craftsman work. It's the equivalent of like, I really know how to use a screwdriver. I really know how to use that mitre saw. And it's not the same as, I know how to uh, provide critique and feedback in a positive way to somebody or to be able to talk to that customer about 
uh, why something's gone wrong or why you've taken a particular approach. So uh, is there any of that soft skill stuff within the the blobs that you've been looking at? And if not, what things do we need to be introducing that aren't within that design career path at the moment? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, no, I think in the blob mapping I was looking at explicitly, that stuff isn't included, unless I suppose there's one whole area which Jason himself admits is is not fully fleshed out, which is called experience strategy, which probably covers a lot of the stuff you're thinking about there. It's the sort of, well, what, where should we be focusing? Uh, what what set of users' concerns are we going to be more worried about? And what set of users' concerns are we going to say, we, we like you, but it's not for you? And how, how do those decisions get made, I think, mm. is, a, is a huge area of that. Um, but I think, yeah, it's the problem with soft skills is that they're really hard, but they're also really, I suppose the softness refers more to the fact that they're quite hard to define sometimes. Do you think it's something that just comes from your experiences? Oh, that's a good question. I think some of it has to, I guess. Do Would you say so? I can think of two or three people that I've had as colleagues in the past where I've loved going to meetings with them because they've blown my mind as to how charming and smart with their responses they are. And and my brain doesn't work yeah. in that way. I do not have time to filter what I am about to say. It just comes out. And I, I very much speak when I talk, it, it's from the heart, or at least that's what it seems like at that point in time. I'm not particularly considered with the way that I think about things. And then I've watched other people mm-hmm. and just gone, damn, if if I could learn how you do that, and of course, if you go and ask them, they couldn't tell you because that's just them. That's their nature. That's that's how they're made. But but it is something which you can learn. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's an interesting idea from a chap called Venkatesh Rao, um, who I've followed for ages. He wrote the Gervais Principle series, if, if anyone's seen those. Um, he talks about, this was just in a, an offhand AMA type thing. Someone was asking, so I think I'm the best at analytics, it was in this case, in in my company, and I think I should be in charge. Uh, What should I do? And he was saying, well, you might be the best in your company. The fact that you think you're the best might mean you're not really the best. But if you want to find out, or if if you want to ascend to the next level, if you want to develop a skill, you have to put yourself in a situation where there's a forcing function. You have to put yourself in a situation where you are now not very good at the skill and you have to learn it in order to succeed Mm. and that will because i mean we know this from our psychology world of ux brains are lazy and if you can get by with what you've got right now the brain isn't going to expend any energy on improving your skill set so you have to put yourself in a situation where it's a matter of survival to develop a new skill a new capability and it's not necessarily fun and easy but it's it's the way that it's that challenge that drives you to learn something new. Um, and this, this makes me think of, so I these days find that actually facilitating workshops, speaking in front of large groups of people is absolutely fine for me. I'm, I have no problem with that. If I think back to me at school, I was horrified, terrified of the idea. I think I, I nearly just didn't go to school when I had to give a a presentation one day for a, a school classroom exercise. The thing that made the difference was I ended up teaching dance in my spare time during my 20s and 30s. And I I was first sort of dropped in it by my teacher who was sort of quietly teaching me how to teach at the same time as teaching me how to dance. And then he just didn't show up one day and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm really late. Can you take the class? And so I didn't have a moment to think about it or think whether it was the right time or what I was going to do. I just had to pick it up and go with it and try something out. And it was terrifying. But then I started teaching more and more. And each time it, it was easier and easier. And I learned a lot of the skills that you need to manage a big group. Uh, a lot of it was, there's so many little subtle things. You're picking up cues from a room. You're 
understanding how the energy levels going up and down you're understanding how to structure the information you're sharing in in chunks that are not too big not too small not too facile you're understanding who's who's way ahead of the rest of the class and who's really struggling and and how to pace the whole thing so that nobody's totally left behind but people aren't totally bored as well and that took years years of practicing but it, what was amazing is how well those skills transfer across mm. to a, a UX or a business setting when you have to run a workshop with people. Especially in that situation of when you have foolishly agreed to someone's notion that 25 people need to be in a workshop and you've you've got all those tables <laughs> yeah. and trying to remember that it's less about you being engaged with one particular group or another, but picking up the ones when they you can see that they're starting to drop off and the interest is waning and you've got to sort of like dive in there to to g them back up and course correct it yes yeah that's that's a fun a fun thing that's something i'm just actually starting right now so i've done a bunch of workshops but with a sensible number of people right now we've just kicked off into a thing where we've got that thing 24 people all in one all in one room four different groups all trying to do basically the same thing but coming at it from totally different ways as well and yeah managing that is a is a next yeah. level you, you definitely need your uh, padawan to your jedi in those situations that's for sure at the moment two camps in here of of what is kind of starting to emerge out of user experience we have design on one side and research on the other we know that we don't have very clear um education paths for either at the moment there there is no yeah. f- degree in user experience although i have been working with somebody on trying to write one recently whether that's going to happen or not who knows that's interesting yeah it's not a thing that's in formal education still so just like yourself most people are still falling into it from either sidestepping in from another space or going through various different directions within a, a traditional design career yeah what are the things that you think are missing from being able to develop those juniors into being really great designers or really great researchers that is a very very big million dollar question um so one of the challenges i suspect is that a degree isn't a good way to learn what is essentially a craft uh so a degree is good for book learning i think the sort of thing you can pick up from reading a book and writing essays and understanding concepts that people have talked about before and is is really valuable um but it's there's a degree a degree to a degree to which a degree is a signaling thing it says i was good enough when i was 18 that i was accepted to university I was able to play the game well enough to be accepted to university and I was able to get through university well enough to get a degree. And that is a, it's like a badge of that's how committed I am and that's how effective I am at getting stuff done when I'm not being fully guided all the time. That's the value of a degree. I don't know of any degrees, sort of proper proper, academic, higher level education type degrees where people actually use any of their degree learning in the job they then take. It's all more esoteric and more theoretical than any job actually is. So I I suspect that it's just not possible to learn the skills you need in a degree. I think research, user research and uh, UX design can be seen more as apprenticeships, more as crafts that you have to study while Mm. doing you learn by doing it and something that I really feel I I I wish I'd had in my early career was was more direct for want of a better word mentorship but a a sort of a master that I could apprentice to and see the craft being done Uh, it's it's going back uh, people use this language now in business as much more of the idea of a guild and uh, a skill set that you learn from other practitioners rather than going to a room and being told things in lectures mm. for, for eight hours a day. See, I, I'm totally on board with the idea of apprenticeships and I, I, it still winds me up that we haven't got there yet because there's no actual justification for it, except for the fact that a, tr- 
a, a formal apprenticeship still has to have this really cliched in institutionalized education element to it and I think we're still rallying against it as an industry of like no you, you're not getting it like we don't want that that's why we're doing the you know that's that's why we're all a bunch of mavericks because you, you know <laughs> education doesn't yeah. work for us but then I definitely rally against the other direction of it of the going down the guild end and I've had a number of conversations with people quite recently actually about the concept of having something where there is a you know CPD driven for uh, you know personal development and, and career development and to me that instantly starts saying membership groups and that there is a body of people who will ultimately end up being unionized dictating what defines as being acceptable good or bad design that is ultimately where that leads and you know mm, yeah that's a huge risk it's a it's a is a massive risk but i definitely would like to see i think that there needs to be more businesses at varying levels who are starting to think about that concept that apprenticeship concept because i feel like the idea of junior and uh graduate roles i mean i can't remember the last time i actually saw someone advertising specifically for a graduate because it acknowledges that you're bringing that person in because you want to take this you know this green wood and turn it into mm. a great oak and no one seems to want to do it anymore it that it seems to have completely disappeared and the same with juniors and one of the things that i keep thinking about with this is like what we're ending up with is people instead going in and doing their eight week intensive 20 grand or whatever it costs general assembly course coming out the end of it and going well clearly i'm a ux designer now commanding yeah. an insane amount of money but we're just we're creating a bigger knowledge gap than what we started with because now we've got a load of people who can mechanically do something with great proficiency, but they still haven't had that experience, like you're saying, of shadowing a person who you know is worn and withered and tired from doing it day in day out, <laughs> and you know knows yeah. knows knows more than they'll ever forget. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of questions there. One is can you get to that worn withered state without just having been through the 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 pains and the strifes and the, the predictable but predictable things but things that you have to actually experience and grow through you can't tell people about it and have them learn it in many cases um the the way uh, the things you're talking about i think are really interesting it's a huge area and there was an article that i read quite recently, which really resonated, which was originally about, should I hire boot camp graduates? And this is in an engineering context. Uh, but the article went on to say, so this is a question this guy gets asked all the time, should I hire boot camp graduates? And his answer is um, not a, 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 an easy yes or no. What it comes down to is, are you ready for the structure that you need in order to hire bootcamp graduates, which gets to what you're saying, you mm. need to be ready and want juniors. The point the chat makes, which I think is spot on, is so many companies in Silicon Valley, in all around the world, are looking for senior level people, not because they need senior level craft skills, but because they need people who can carry on working even though everything is chaotic and on fire. And if you're a junior... That's, that's too much to deal with. You're just trying to get to grips with the basics of your craft. And that's fine. And that should be the case. Well, it's that or you end up becoming institutionalized to that being the norm, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're born into a, a toxic environment that's burning, then you will think it's normal. And so then your behavior and the way in which you approach the problems will be reflective of that. Absolutely, yes. And you'll get special defense mechanisms that save you in that particular environment, which can be, uh, yeah, toxic. It can then be really unhelpful when you move to another environment. And it's, it's not like that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, how do you, it, it's a huge question. How do you avoid that? Because there still are companies that are a total mess. And, and that's always going to be the case. You can't fix that. Mm. Um, one of the things that uh, this article also talks about is, is, why not think about, this is development teams, but it could apply to any cross-functional team, why not think about it more like a teaching hospital where you don't have a load of senior doctors, one of whom is really excitable and one of whom 
probably just waits till the whole till the patient dies and then replaces it with a new patient. You have some senior doctors who are ready to step in in case things wrong uh, things go wrong. You have others who are really good at guiding new people. You have one who's a specialist anaesthetist who who handles everything, so you're going to have a, a, an easy way to work. And then you have some juniors there who are learning, and they they might do some of the, the tasks, mm. but they're not expected to jump in at the same level. Uh, and that model, I think, is quite quite interesting. Well, isn't that? I mean, this is very much how universities, uh, some universities, are working. So I know, like the, uh, be- I believe it's called the Innovation Lab at Sussex. They are basically an incubator for startups, and part of that program is that you effectively get given a research grad. So someone who's maybe doing post grad and is wanting to gain commercial experience and they they sell them out effectively so they oh, they right, yeah. they they bill them in so it seems like perhaps there's there's some you know machinations there of some of these concepts coming in but yeah i think that the idea of being able to uh, effectively have scrubs 2.0 is a is a genius idea yeah or is safe by the bell the new class where you still have Screech <laughs> yeah. and you've still got Mr. Belding, but they're just kind of guiding people through. It's like rebirthing your company effectively, isn't it? Like, you know, we've we've all done it. Now let's replace us with newer, younger actors and see whether see whether we can repeat the success. I think there's there's definitely something in that. Okay, we are getting close to running out of time. So I've got two more questions for you. The first one is, what are the new fields or areas Ooh. that are starting to emerge that you think are worth exploring? New fields or areas. So then you get to the question of, is anything really new or are we just rediscovering the same things again? Well, I know that I played on virtual reality machines at Thought Park in like 1994, so that's definitely not new. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were a bit different back then, weren't they? <laughs> uh, I, I remember those two. Very, very uh, high tech. <laughs> um, so that's a new field so this is more in general I was thinking one that I think is being talked about a lot this year but I don't think is new and I don't and, and I think it is astonishing that people haven't got yet is the idea of UX writing mm. or the fact that you need to write good words in order to have a good experience it seems to have been bizarrely forgotten uh, but that, that's sort of another area uh, I've actually got um Rachel Rachel McConnell's book, Why well, You Need a Content Team, arrived on my doorstep yesterday, which uh, I'm very ah, much looking okay. forward to reading for the same reason. Yeah, that's good. I, I do balk a little bit at the idea of content. Um, content yeah, on content. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> one of my... Uh, one of my uh, uh, a very, uh, my girlfriend, actually, is a, is a brilliant copywriter, and she wrote an article about this where... She pointed out that nobody wakes up in the morning hoping that they'll find content in their inbox. Mm. And I think it's, it, it's a dangerous uh, label to put on stuff, I suppose, um, to put on something. What, what do you want? Is, is it content or is it actually something more meaningful? Um, why is the content being written? Is it being written for the sake of the company or is it being written for the specific customer you're thinking of? That's under the whole area. Well, it's also implying that content is only the written word as well. It is. And of course, it's, you know, technically it's everything and anything. Right? Exactly. Yes. It's one of these things yeah. that's simultaneously so broad as to be useless and also used in a very specific way by certain fields. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's a nightmare. Anyway, that's going on to semantics. And, but we love it. We, we've spent hardly any time defining the damn thing. And we're UX designers. So really, we've, we've broken the rules. <laughs> So content, content, UX content writing. I think, yeah, I think it, but that's really a sort of, it's almost a return to the very beginning of the web where you could just write words and that was the whole thing. We went down a whole, a whole world of, of drawing boxes instead. Yeah, we've, we've, we're reversing the, the layout trends. I, I honestly hope that within the next year, someone, some Gen Zer 
discovers the uh, CSS Zen garden and goes, whoa, 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 <laughs> what's all this about? And brings it back. Because that, I feel like that should be everyone's rite of passage into doing anything on the web. Oh, God, it totally should. Yes. <laughs> now, that would be your final degree, uh, like, assessment, is you have to do that, do a CSS Zen garden thing that passes muster. With, it would be uh, wonderful. So let's see other fields in general in the world. I suspect we are going to see um, pretty soon. I think the whole machine learning revolution is going to start to tail off. I think the hype machine is going to stop. And we're going to start looking for the next artificial intelligence, automation methods um, Mm. to to make that work. That is a very controversial statement to make because I'd imagine a lot of people would be saying it's going in the other direction of that it's, starting to leave the hands of data scientists and engineers and being turned into products which you can use it is so okay so i don't think we're at the, the at the peak or maybe we're at the peak right now i think there's going to be the turnaround i think there's always the hype cycle and i suspect that machine learning is being applied to things right now that probably don't need machine learning and I think then there's going to be the, mm-hmm. the moment of realizing, my God, this is a very expensive way to do a very simple thing. And then <laughs> that will be then a crash and suddenly it'll be like, oh, machine learning's over. And then we'll come back with a, ah, but in certain areas, actually, in specific ways, machine learning is brilliant. And now we've got mature on the way to do machine learning. And so mm. here we go. I have a, a, an ex-colleague who's a, who's a great data scientist. And has, he, his job at the moment, he's a, con- a consultant contractor data scientist and his job mainly seems to be to go into companies to tell them that they are still six months of data engineering away from being able to even consider any data science (laughs) they're still they've still got their training data to work through and uh figuring out what it's supposed to be telling them all of that yeah they've got to get the training data into a form that anyone can read or understand uh yeah it's 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 right there it's good to know. I will try and avoid those as much as possible. <laughs> so one final question for you then. In the context of a leadership role or a senior role of any kind, what's the best advice that you've been given? Oh, best advice. I went to a couple of wonderful talks which were put on by, uh, it was, it, it's called Crap Talks. It's a London thing. Ironically, they're, they're the best sort of meetup talks I've been to. So CRAP stands for Conversion Rate, Analytics and Product. Uh, they did a, a special little thread, which was called CRAP Future Leaders. And there were a couple of talks there. One was by uh, Jane Austen, spelt with an I, who's currently at Babylon Health, but a fa- fantastic UX mm-hmm. leader. Um, I think a lot of people would have heard of her. And another was by a chap called Ed Goldfinger, who's a CFO. And they shared their journey into exa- and, and shared their learnings in exactly this question. And I think the, f- the biggest message they had, which resonated totally with me uh, in the steps that I've taken, is that when you step from practitioner into your first sort of leadership role, you're basically starting from scratch again. It's a different game. Everything's different. And you have to start again from the beginning and learn, learn everything again. And I think that's probably the biggest the biggest thing to realise. Thank you for listening to this episode of The UX Coach. If you are new here, you can subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Spotify and anywhere else you get your feeds from. You can also sign up to our monthly newsletter featuring the best posts from around the world on digital careers and practices. We want to give a voice to the often unheard stars of this field. If you'd like to join this conversation on digital design and research careers, get in touch with us at our website, theuxcoach.com. I'll be back in a few weeks with another guest to talk about their experiences of navigating digital design and the new opportunities ahead. Until then, why not come and find us on Twitter and tell us what you think at the UX Coach Pod.